Sure, all of, all of us appreciate the opportunity to come together on this Lord's Day morning, be present in an assembly where we can worship together and along with others who are with us as we live stream our worship to those who are with us online. But there are a lot of reasons to appreciate a tree. We all appreciate trees. They do a lot of things, a lot of benefits to our lives from trees. We don't normally think of benefiting spiritually from a tree, do we? I think, oh, okay, well, all of us have realized an evidence in our own design for creation. But when you study a tree and the life of a tree, I have a book that talks about the hidden life of a tree, what you can't see, and it's unbelievable, just like it is for the human body. What happens inside a tree, it could only have been designed by a creator, but there are so many benefits. There might even be disagreement with the title of this sermon this morning. How in the world can you get faith from a tree? <laughs> well, the point is, Romans 10, 17 says, faith cometh of hearing and hearing the word of God. Don't we get faith from scripture? Absolutely. Well, a tree, it doesn't seem to be consistent with what the Bible teaches, but it is. So getting faith from a tree starts in Mark chapter 11. So I invite you to open your New Testaments to the Gospel of Mark uh, chapter 11 and this incident with the Lord uh, in uh, Mark 11 begins at verse 12. So I'm going to begin, if you will, to read this passage beginning with the 12th verse and reading through verse 14. Follow with me. And on the morrow, when they were come out from Bethany, he hungered, and seeing a fig tree afar off, having leaves, he came if happily he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season of figs. And he answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit from thee henceforth forward forever. And his disciples heard it. We are familiar with this occasion. Just to put things in perspective, this is occurring during the final week the earlier part of chapter 11 is the triumphal entry on what you and I would call, like today, the first day of the week. And when Mark said on the morrow, that means on Monday morning. This event happened where Jesus cursed this tree and the disciples heard it. There are reasons and discussions could be held upon that. But what we want to note, what happened from this is significant. And we note from, especially as we go to verse 19, after he cleansed the temple, even on the very next day, they passed by in the morning, verse 20 said, and they saw the fig tree withered away from the roots. And Peter, calling to remembrance, saith unto him, Rabbi, behold, the fig tree which thou cursed is withered away. Now, what... This statement of Peter is stated with an element of surprise. It's stated so that he makes known to those who hear and read this statement, he could not believe it. We all know that uh, if you cut a tree down, a live tree, and it's severed from the stump, it takes quite a few days, depending on species, for even the leaves to wither, turn brown. I mean, a withering tree takes place, even when it's completely severed from the root system, takes time. But what happened here is that Peter noted, Lord, you just cursed this tree yesterday and already it's completely withered away from the roots. The root system is gone and the tree is dead completely. And he couldn't believe that this had happened. Well, Jesus responded to this. 
And that's no doubt his design and purpose. And his purpose is to teach some lessons from this tree. And that's how we get faith from a tree, because Jesus taught lessons from this tree. So our lessons actually come from the teaching of Christ about this tree. And so as it turns out, Jesus teaches lessons about faith. Well, that's, that seems to be the immediate need, or at least the purpose that the Lord wants to accomplish, especially with Peter and the other disciples, that how could such a thing happen? Well, that, that is a good question. Well, we get faith from the teaching of Christ through this tree, but Jesus, in the next few verses, and I want you to read them carefully with me, Jesus discusses several things in which we are to have faith. And he talks about it from this tree and what happened. And so Jesus, as we consider what Jesus said about each of these, I would suggest to you that each thing that he discussed that we're to have faith in as we learn from this tree is important to you especially during difficult times. I think that's why I was drawn to this occasion because the Lord is teaching all of us some things that are helpful to us every single day, but especially when our lives are challenged and troubled by events that are happening in the world and our health and other matters. And so we ask a, a, a question then, what is it that Jesus teaches about faith in this passage from this tree. Well, in the very next verse, that's verse 22 in the same text, Jesus answering saith unto them, in other words, Peter made the statement, the observation, but he addresses all of the disciples, and said unto them, have faith in God. That's a very simple, straightforward, concise statement. I said, well, Obviously, the Lord in his teaching felt that faith was needed by everyone, including his apostles. He would think that about us. All of us need faith. All of us need a stronger faith. And his very first lesson from this tree is you have faith in God. The explanation for that tree changing the way that it did so quickly and so unnaturally is the power of God. God did that. Well. But we understand how that is, is true. So the very point that he's making and the first subject that we are to have is faith in God from this tree. Well, we all may think, well, I've got faith in God, but let me take us to several thoughts that should be helpful in measuring, making sure that we have faith in God in the right way. There are four things about God that you should have faith in. When Jesus said, have faith in God, it's not just simple, faith in God. No. Well, there are some things about him that we must have faith in. One of them is in his person. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, uh, he that cometh to God must believe that he is. Okay. The Hebrew writer said that. Without faith it is impossible to be well-pleasing unto him, but he that cometh must believe or have faith that he is, that he exists, that he is a person, a living being. He is deity, but he is a living being. We must believe that, and we must relate to him in a personal way, but not only in his person, but also in his power. Jesus said in this passage in Matthew chapter 22 and verse 29, he told them that they err for two reasons. One is they don't know the scriptures. And secondly, they don't know the power of God. Okay. You and I need to have faith in the power of God. And we learn some things about God's power in the scriptures. But the third is his promises. He's promised a lot of things. And we not only are to have faith in his person, but in what he promised. Not only in his power, but what he promised. He promised you and me some very important things. And we must have faith in those promises. But then fourthly, 
We must have faith in his providence. Do you have faith in the providence of God? Uh, the, the Bible teaches about the providence of God. The New Testament teaches us a lot about the providence of God. In Romans chapter 8 is my key passage on this, verse 28, where he said, all things work together for good. God is so involved and so interactive in our lives in response to us as his children and answer to prayer that all things work together for good. He is providing for our good. And, and only are good. You notice all of those begin with the letter P. I'm sure you already, it's a good way to remember them. Uh, power, uh, person, power, uh, promises, and providence all involve things about God that we're to have faith in. But what Jesus is teaching in this passage as he continues is faith in God provides for us to do big things by big, big how that's relative, isn't it? Some things that we would not otherwise be able to do. And we would also suggest, provides for us to do things that are otherwise impossible. How did you do that? With God's help. And so faith in God provides for us to do big, otherwise impossible things. Notice how Jesus taught that. This is what he means. He said, Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou taken up and cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that what he saith cometh to pass, he shall have it. So we, we understand that the Lord is not talking literally. He didn't want the disciples. He didn't want you to Pray that a mountain be cast into the sea. That's not his purpose. What he's teaching us is there are some things that would seem to you that are too difficult for you, that would otherwise be impossible for you, that can be accomplished with God's help. Have faith in God. And when we, we, when we see that there's seemingly no good outcome, that nothing good can come from this, or it must be the worst end possible, then we need to have faith in God. So let me uh, suggest some things. We may say, I've got problems right now that are unbelievably burdensome. You may or may not at this time, sometime we all do, have faith in God. I'm facing some challenges that seem to be getting the best of me. <laughs> Sometimes that can seem too, too often. But have faith in God. I'm deep, deeply concerned about my future and about the future of my family and the future of my loved ones, about what the future holds for them and their children. Have faith in God. Obstacles in going to heaven at times seem so insurmountable I want to go to heaven, but sometimes it seems so difficult, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to deal with and overcome everything that seems to be in my way sometimes. Have faith in God. So from this tree, what he taught these disciples is a wonderful lesson for you and for me. It's not simplistic. We all need to have faith in God. We all need to have a growing, stronger faith in God. We need to depend upon him just like the Lord taught in this passage. This is faith from a tree, faith in God. Well, there is another matter that Jesus taught. If you have your, your Bible open, you will note that he included in this discussion. Now, something very closely related to faith in God, but something also needs to be dealt with and thought about separately. Inseparably related, but in its own, its own entity. In Mark chapter 11, our text, and this time verse 24, therefore I say unto you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe, that you have received them, and they shall be granted you. 
there are a lot of scriptures in the New Testament about prayer. Mark chapter 11 and verse 24 has always been regarded by this Bible student as one of the key passages for our faith. Because what he's talking about here is obviously very closely related to faith in God. There's no question about that, and we're not separating them, but we're talking about this on its own merit. Jesus is also teaching from this tree. You've got to have faith in prayer. Okay, well, what do you mean, Lord? Well, uh, just, let's read the verse again before we leave it because we're going to be referring back to it. He said, I, I say unto you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe, or have faith, there's the faith, that you have received them and they shall be granted. Now there's a slight variation in some translations on that, but it all comes out the same in that we're to have faith in prayer. Our faith in prayer must be a belief that God answers. Now granted, and all of us would certainly be quick to respond and say, well, he doesn't answer every time the way I think he should, or the way I expect, or the way I want, but we need to have faith that God answers every prayer. Faith from the tree, faith in prayer. In verse 23, here's a very important point. Jesus has just said in the previous verse, remember, shall ask and shall not doubt in his heart. So asking in faith means we don't doubt. <laughs> My faith in prayer means that I pray believing that God will answer prayer and there's not a doubt in my heart. You see, that takes some spiritual growth for that. You can't just have that quality overnight or incidentally or carelessly. You have to work on that. But we would also note in this that Jesus is referencing prayer that is in harmony with the characteristics of true prayer. No one should read Matthew or Mark chapter 11 and these verses when he talks about prayer, especially verse 24, and think, well, he's just talking about prayer in any way, any form, any fashion. Anybody can pray any way they want. No, that, that would be a terrible, terrible mistake. Jesus is talking about here True prayer, and true prayer is identified in the scriptures. So we don't have to make anything up or have to imagine something because we're taught by God and by God's word what true prayer is, that if we ask anything according to his will. So you start praying and you pray a bunch of things that are not according to his will, that are just simply selfish and, and secularly centered and things that have nothing to do with God and God's will. You can bet he's not listening. He doesn't hear every single prayer that's uttered. So we have to understand the Lord's teaching about faith in prayer. It's faith in true prayer. Faith in prayer the way that it is revealed for us to pray. And from this passage, we learn very quickly that we must ask according to his will. He heareth us. That's a promise. That's one of those promises. But no, notice the continuation of that statement. If we know that he heareth us, if you believe that, that God is hearing you, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions which we have asked. Now that's faith and prayer, and that's faith from this tree. Let's, perhaps you've already thought of this passage in James chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. You remember James starts out in the very early verses of his book, book of James, uh, about if any of you lack wisdom, <laughs> some days it feels like a lot of wisdom lacking here. But here is James' solution. Let him ask God. But let him ask in faith. See, this is faith in prayer. Nothing doubting. For he that doubted is like the surge of the sea, driven by the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Now that's again a very affirmative, straightforward, factual statement. We must pray 
in faith, with faith, nothing doubting. And the reason that James gives for that is if you pray in doubting, you're just like the person that waffles back and forth. Oh, okay, maybe so, maybe not. Maybe so, maybe not. Like the surge of the sea driven by the wind and tossed. But the kicker to this verse, in my opinion, the really the one that gets our attention, let not that man think that he shall receive anything. He's not going to have answer to prayer. Faith from a tree. In faith in prayer. So we need to grow and learn from Jesus as he teaches us some important lessons, not only about God, and you see how inseparably linked these two things are. We believe in him. We believe in his person, his power, his promises, his providence. But we also believe in him as our father who listens to our prayers and hears our prayers. And we believe that he is always responding to us in our lives for our good. Okay. What other thing you think Jesus talks about around this dead tree, this withered fig tree? Faith from a tree. Well, uh, let, let's see what he says next. This is verse 25 in that same passage, Mark 11. Whensoever you stand praying, and he carries it into the next subject, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your transgressions. So isn't it interesting? It's saying to me, if you think about it, Jesus is going to be discussing faith. On, uh, th this is on Tuesday morning of the final week, and just... Uh, two days he'll be observing the Passover, instituting the Lord's Supper. On the third day, that is on Friday of this very week, he's going to be nailed to the cross. This is that final week. This is Tuesday morning that he's teaching this. And so you, you, you might think he would be teaching some things uh, bigger or more, in our view, important. But lo and behold, he teaches about faith in God. He teaches about faith and prayer, and he teaches about faith and forgiveness. What do we need in order to make sure that we go to heaven? In one word, if we're going to express it that way, uh, forgiveness. And so that's what, the, that, that's what he's saying in this verse. Whenever you stand praying, uh, he's not um, requiring a posture here. He just referring to the way that the Jews prayed most of the time. They stood and prayed. Now, that doesn't mean that we always have to, he, he requires that posture of us. We can sit and pray. We can kneel and pray. But the point is that when we pray, he said, forgive. If you have anything against anyone. Why? Well, there's a good reason. <laughs> There's good reason to pray and forgive. Forgive while you're praying. So that your Father, who is in heaven, may forgive you. What? You mean we have to have faith and forgiveness. Let's look at this and what we can learn. We must have faith that our forgiveness takes place in the mind of God. Sometimes we hear people make statements that forgiveness, their forgiveness of sin takes place in their own mind. No, it doesn't. <laughs> if you're forgiven of sin, if your sins are forgiven, that forgiveness has taken place in the mind of God. It must take place there. Now there's an awareness, but your sins are forgiven in the mind of God and nowhere else. And that we must have faith in, okay? Sometimes when people doubt their, their salvation or doubt their forgiveness, maybe it comes to this point, and this is where we need to study and think and, and have a stronger faith, that, that I have faith in forgiveness because my forgiveness has taken place in the mind of God. God has forgiven me of my sins. How do you know that? Well... Because I feel, that, no, that, that's not good enough. 
We know that because God has revealed when he does that. God reveals when he forgives you. And when we do what God said to do to have that forgiveness, we know by faith that he has forgiven us. In 1 John chapter 1 and in verse 9, if we confess our sins, see here's one thing that God looks for. He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Well, that's an interesting thought because it's conditional, isn't it? Now here, keep in mind, is John is writing to those that are already Christians. Uh, an alien sinner or someone who has never obeyed the gospel cannot just confess a sin and be forgiven. That, that's not what the Bible teaches. But for those who are Christians, those who are children of God, he, he has a different set of conditions. And here John is talking about one of them. If you confess, he'll forgive you. He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us that not only forgiveness but the cleansing of the, the, the spiritual blemish that comes from sin. But here's something else we must believe. We must not only believe that our forgiveness takes place in the mind of God. We must believe that God's forgiveness of our sins is conditioned upon our forgiveness of others. Oh, that can't be. That can't be. Oh, it's true. Uh, we know it's true because that's what the Bible teaches. And that's what the Lord is teaching around this withered tree. And he is teaching that in such a way that wherever you stand praying, remember, he said, forgive. Why, Lord, do you want me to forgive? So your Father who is in heaven will forgive you. And so we understand what he's teaching. That becomes a condition, and we must. But I also have a statement that we all will remember from the Sermon on the Mount. And that is when the Lord was saying, and after this manner pray, and he gave what most people call the Lord's Prayer. But it's really a prayer for the Lord's disciples to pray. Because he's giving a form of prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Uh, well, the kingdom has come, uh, but we need to pray for the kingdom to advance and grow. And so that's a part of our prayer. But also as a part of this prayer, he said to pray for forgiveness. Pray for the forgiveness of your sins. You need forgiveness to go to heaven. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 12, forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. So being sinning against is like a debt. Um, someone sins against us, there are debtors. When forgiveness, that debt is no longer there. It's forgiven. It's like Paying something off. And that's a good feeling, isn't it? But the Lord's teaching in this Bible principle, apparently upon this occasion, uh, the Lord in this close relationship of God, prayer, and forgiveness, is teaching this close relationship and why each of those is important. Faith from a tree. Look at this passage and understand when it took place and why it took place. Uh, I would love to have seen this miracle as it occurred then occur. When he cursed the tree on Monday, by Tuesday it was dead to the roots. But he used that occasion when asked out of interest by the Apostle Peter, Lord, uh, this has happened. Let me teach you. And he taught these lessons about having faith in God, having faith in prayer, and faith in forgiveness. Uh, sometimes I like to think of, in terms of simplify. That's Thoreau, right? <laughs> we, we read that in literature. 
simplify, simplify, simplify. Well, that's a good motto for life. But isn't that what this passage does? This passage is an actual event that took place upon the face of the earth. It's recorded in Scripture for us to read and benefit from. But how important it is, but how simple it is. If we can have faith in God, if we can have faith in prayer and faith in forgiveness, think what that does for your going to heaven. How many other things will be taken care of? So as we prepare to sing our invitation song this morning, there may be someone present subject to the invitation of Christ. Uh, it was just a few days from this incident around this withered tree that Jesus did go to the cross. He was nailed to the cross that Friday morning, about 9 o'clock in the morning. Remained there for the six hours until about 3 or so. But he did that in order to provide your salvation and mine. And we talk about that often, and we should. We will observe the Lord's Supper in just a few minutes for that purpose of remembering that. But if you're not yet a Christian, uh, you may not be in the right relationship to that death or to him as your Lord. And what he requires of you to have that forgiveness of your sin as one who is not yet a Christian is that you believe in him, that you repent of your sins, that you confess your faith, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and to be immersed in water, baptized for the remission of your sins. And we might be able to help you with that today. But if you're an erring child of God and you have committed sin, by all means, have faith. Have faith in God, have faith in prayer, have faith in forgiveness. See, those are things that will continue you, your journey to heaven. If we can be of help to you today, let us know while together we stand and sing.